In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thomas Cahill, in his How the Irish Saved Civilization, describes two silver cups that were found in the marshes of Ireland. The first, called the Gundestrup Cauldron, dates from one to two centuries before the birth of Christ. It portrays a time when the Irish worshipped their ancient and violent gods. This particular chalice is adorned with pictures of gods and warriors. Our panel, one panel, shows a gigantic cook god holding squirming humans and dropping them into a vat of oil. These gods demand human sacrifice to appease their appetite. The second cup is called the Ardog Chalice. It dates a few centuries after the resurrection of Jesus Christ during the time of Celtic Christianity. It too is skillfully made. What strikes you at the outset about the art of the chalice is that there is one God, not many gods, and this one God is different from all the gods that these people had ever known. The pattern is much simpler than the pagan one. The apostles' names are etched on it, Below the names of the apostles are panels with birds and animals and creation, all pointing to the restoration of Eden, the new heavens and the new earth. This cup conveys the theology that Jesus Christ reconciles all things in heaven and on earth. It is a cup of peace. As someone has observed, when one lifts this Christian cup to his mouth, he is reminded that God no longer demands any sacrifice and certainly never required human sacrifices. God has offered His only Son once for all on the cross. This sacrifice is truly a sacrifice, but of a totally different kind, for this sacrifice brings peace. In our readings today, and particularly the epistle lesson on which I would like to focus, St. Paul commends preach the gospel, which for him is preaching the cross. He then adds, quote, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. In the remainder of the passage, the apostle unpacks the contrast between the so-called foolishness of preaching the gospel and the wisdom of this world. The rest of St. Paul's letter, very significantly, I believe, unfolds the message of the introduction about the preaching and the theology of the cross. One could say that 1 Corinthians is a theology of the cross tour de force. As we convene this Congress, I see God's message for us based on this passage to preach the gospel of the cross to heal divisions, to show forth his death in the Eucharist until he comes, and to suffer unto victory for others. First, St. Paul emphasizes the foolishness of preaching the gospel. The Catholic side of the church today is often viewed as emphasizing the sacrament, whereas the Protestants the preaching of the word. How these things happen, I don't know. But as we look at the Holy Scriptures, there is not an antithesis between these two, and particularly we see it in the epistle of the Corinthians. For to the contrary in 1 Corinthians and the Catholic faith itself, word and sacrament are not mutually exclusive. One leads to the other. The important 20th century Swiss theologian Jean-Jacques von Allman writes in his invaluable little book on preaching and the congregation that preaching the gospel word is essential, but preaching in the Bible always leads to the sacrament, either to the baptismal font, to the altar, and therefore to both. Catholic preacher at the Eucharist always, I like to say, makes an altar call. 
Therefore, good Catholic preaching is essential to the recovery of the faith once delivered, and especially the gospel sacrament. St. Paul is specific, though. His call is to preach the gospel, according to him, is the proclamation of the cross. I say this because the preaching, preaching the cross is not necessarily the same and, and totally different from bringing sociology, psychology, and even philosophy into the pulpit. And if I might add, just because someone says he preaches the Bible does not necessarily mean he's preaching the cross. I saw a sign outside of a community church in Dallas the other day advertising the preacher's sermon series. It was entitled, The Verse-by-Verse -verse Study of Exodus, The Psychological Hang-Ups of Moses. <laughs> the Bible from beginning to end proclaims Christ. As we know from that phenomenal Emmaus Road Bible study at the end of Luke, the text says, quote, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, verse 27. If the word is properly preached, the sermon will be about Jesus Christ and him alone crucified. It will be not only Christological, it should be cruciform. Look for the cross in Scripture from Genesis through Revelation. It's there. Second, in our passage, St. Paul not only calls for preaching the cross, but this preaching according to him heals divisions. Let us not forget the context of the writing of 1 Corinthians. Healing divisions in the church at Corinth is precisely what prompts him to declare the solution as being preach the cross. The blessed apostle writes in the verses immediately preceding our passage for consideration, quote, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and there be no divisions among you but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. How I mean this, one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? In uh, verses 10 through 13. I believe St. Paul speaks directly to us, and particularly at this Congress, which is a Congress of Anglo-Catholics, I think he speaks right into the heart of us. I could easily substitute ourselves in the passage about the sad divisions that have impaired our ability to proclaim the gospel. You see, there is an elephant in our living room as Anglo-Catholics. I've often described some of us as all too often a people who agree on most everything but can't get along on anything. It seems we must avoid, ironically, the Puritan mindset of what I call separatist exclusivity. This is a kind of separation without being connected to the global ancient communion and seas. I remind us of the non-Jewers, who not of their own choosing in their case, were separated from somehow reconnecting. And as you may know, they tried with Constantinople through Russia specifically Peter the Great, to be reconnected. And if uh, Peter had lived long enough, it may have happened. But the non-jurors died off. They live on in their theology, we know, through Wesley, Wesley's great Eucharistic hymns, 130 he wrote, by the way, influenced by the non-jurors, and of course, the Oxford and Tractarian movements. Those of us in ACNA have tried to learn from the fallacy of exclusivist 
ex, uh, separatism. That unchurches nearly everyone except your own little circle. It's the pattern of separate and then unchurch everybody else. This seems to be but another version of the pure church mindset that the Puritans promoted. And as you know, they all became Unitarians. As someone has once quipped, if you think you found the perfect church, don't go there, you'll ruin it. <laughs> Apparently, in some sense, separatistic exclusivity was the problem for that early Corinthian church. The good news, however, to which I call our attention and hopefully send us out of this Congress with is that St. Paul exhorts the Corinthians to preach the cross to heal the sad division. Somehow the preaching and the theology of the cross heals divisions. So I have to conclude, we haven't had enough of the cross. We haven't had enough preaching. We haven't had enough living it. We need to return to the message of 1 Corinthians. Separatistic movements tend to die. They all start off thinking they're going to purify, and they do momentarily, but they have a history of dying, whether it's the old Catholics, the non-jurors, the old believers, you name it. We have to be connected to the whole, and we are only going to be that way through the preaching of the cross. And so I call us to become gospel Catholics. Gospel Catholics. As someone observed, there are two ways of coming together. One is being frozen together. The other is being melted together. My prayer for this Congress is that it has in some way begun the melting. I ask all of us to consider what we might do to help one another melt into a unity through the preaching of the cross. For St. Paul, preaching the cross is at the heart, and this takes me to my third point. Let us not miss, however, the important connection in St. Paul's mind between preaching the cross and the blessed sacrament of Holy Communion, which outside of the institution of the Eucharist, the biggest Eucharistic section in the New Testament is here in 1 Corinthians. For the Apostle, the Eucharist proclaims the cross. Notice what he says later in the Eucharistic section of the book, chapters 10 through 11. He writes, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Eucharist proclaims the death of Jesus Christ. It proclaims the cross. In the history of the Catholic Church's understanding of the cruciform nature of the Eucharist, it is the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist that conveys the picture of the cross. Jesus said of the Eucharist, This is the blood of the covenant poured out for many. Sacrificial language. It's clearly not the language of re-sacrifice. Rather, since Christ who died for our sins is really present in the Eucharist, the church, through one simple liturgical practice, emphasizes the sacrificial nature of Christ in the Eucharist. The priest elevates the host and the chalice to show forth the living, crucified Christ as the once-for-all sacrifice. He elevates before God the Father, declaring that we only come to the Father through the crucified Christ. It is the proclamation of the cross at that moment, I believe. And all the people see and are reminded that we only come to God the Father through the cross. Finally, the preaching of the cross that heals divisions and leads to Eucharistic sacrifice forms the willing life of suffering unto victory for others. 
St. Paul's emphasis on the preaching of the cross leads to the powerful teaching later in his epistle on the resurrection in the 15th chapter. The connection between the cross and the resurrection appears in the form of a powerful image that showed up in our gospel reading in John 12. Paul brings the cross and the resurrection together with the picture of the, of the planting, burying, and rising of a seed into life. He refers to the resurrection that way. This image draws on Jesus' teaching in John 12 that a seed must die. And by the way, in John 12, Jesus is applying that preaching of the cross to a life of the cross that the disciples must embrace, for they too must die. They will carry the cross. They will suffer because they carry the cross. We are called to suffer for the faith, not in despair, but with the great teaching of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, that as Jesus died, was buried like a seed into the ground, he came forth, he rose again. And so we too, as believers in Jesus Christ, through suffering for the cross, carrying the cross, we too will, like a seed, find our moments when we are buried, but the good news is, in Christ we rise again. A friend of mine, many years ago, was praying outside of an abortion clinic for God to stop the slaughter of the innocents in this land. The local sheriff at the time overstepped his bounds and had his uh, uh, force come and physically and violently arrest an entire group of Christians who were doing nothing more than praying outside an abortion clinic. So they all ended up in jail. They called their lawyers, but the local prosecutor blocked the processes so that these Christians ended up in jail for many days. My friend explained that an interesting development occurred among the Christians in jail. He said after about two or three days, a number of the Christians began to lose heart because they, they couldn't understand why God would allow them to remain in jail. And he said, it's as though he began to see a crack in the theology, a lack of understanding of the theology of suffering. Then others began to be distraught. My friend observed that only the Christians who had a theology of suffering were able to endure the ordeal faithfully. And importantly, he at that time noticed that it was the Christians from some kind of Catholic background who had that theology of suffering. Not saying that certainly others don't, but this struck a chord with my friend. Because in the Catholic Church, Anglican, Roman, Orthodox, there is a common thread of a theology of suffering. The theology of the cross is the theology behind suffering. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, we are now entering into the phase of being called into the life of the cross of suffering for our faith, of which you know, on this continent, in America, we have not really had to do. Maybe a little social ostracizing, but not really have we had to suffer like our brothers and sisters elsewhere. I'm reminded of, a, of an incredible statement I, I, I heard Father Alexander Schmemann of Blessed Memory make many years ago, many, many years ago, over three decades now. He was giving a talk, I don't remember what the topic was, and he was asked afterwards about the struggles of the Russian Orthodox Church under communism. And he responded with a comment that I shall never forget. 
He said, the best thing that ever happened to us was that we had to worship in garages. Well, he went on to explain that was through that suffering that there was the work of the Lord in the life of the Russian church. A, a great rediscovery of, of who they were and, and the way of the cross. There is an eerie, eerie parallel between our culture today and late 19th century Russia. The way of the cross, its preaching in word and sacrament and suffering is what I believe God calls us to at the end of this Congress. Bishop Frank Weston is known for his famous address at one of the Anglo-Catholic Congresses. As I come to clo a close, it is good to recall his words from this remarkable sermon called Our Present Duty, which I'd like to say is our continuing present duty. He said, there then, as I conceive it, is your present duty. And I beg you, brethren, as you love the Lord Jesus, consider that it is at least possible that this is the new light that the Congress has to bring to us. You have got your mass. You have got your altar. You have begun to get your tabernacle. Now go out into the highways and hedges where not even bishops will try to hinder you. Go out and look for Jesus in the ragged, in the naked, in the oppressed and sweated, in those who have lost hope, in those who are struggling to make good. Look for Jesus. And when you see him, gird yourselves with his towel and try to wash their feet. This is the theology of the cross. This is our present duty. I leave us, therefore, with the words of an unknown poet, Return the cross to Golgotha. I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace, as well as on the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves on a town garbage heap at a crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew and Latin and in Greek, and at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble because that is where he died. And that is what he died about. And that is where Christ's people ought to be and what the church of God ought to be about. And I would add, I believe it is what gospel Catholics are to be about. Amen.